to um, I'm going to chant a psalm for us tonight. Uh, chant Psalm 96. And that is a responsorial setting. Um, I will do the response. If you pick up the response and you want to sing it along, um, when you hear it, please feel free to do that. Um, but I won't take the time to teach that um, to us tonight. And at the end of at the end of the chanted psalm, um, there will be a spoken prayer that um, takes the words of those of the psalm um, and and sets it uh, in I think some very moving and contemporary words. So this is Psalm ninety six. Um, let us go to our Holy Spirit in prayer. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let all that is in them sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless the name of the Lord. Proclaim God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations and God's wonders among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, more to be feared than all gods. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let all that is in them sing to the Lord. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols, but you, O Lord, have made the heavens. Majesty and magnificence are in your presence. Power and splendor are in your sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord your families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to the holy name. Bring offerings and enter the courts of the Lord. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before the Lord, all the earth. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let all that is in them sing to the Lord. Tell it out among the nations, the Lord is king. The one who made the world so firm that it cannot be moved will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea thunder and all that is in it let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood shout for joy at your coming, O Lord, for you come to judge the earth. You will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with your truth and the peoples with your truth. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let all that is in them sing to the Lord. The old song of my spirit has wearied itself out. It has long ago been learned by heart. It repeats itself over and over bringing no added joy to my days or lift to my spirit. I will sing a new song. I must learn the new song for the new needs. I must fashion new words born of all the new growth of my life, of my mind, of my spirit. I must prepare for new melodies that have never been mine before, that all that is within me may lift my voice unto God. Therefore, I shall rejoice with each new day and delight my spirit in each fresh unfolding. I will sing this day a new song unto the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kim. Who was that contemporary version by? Hope you're on mute now again. It was Howard Thuman. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody to this virtual quiet day, virtual both in terms of meeting in Zoom and also in that we have we are not meeting chronologically on a quiet day, so I invite you to imagine yourself on a Saturday morning at 10 a.m. and you have five hours ahead of you that you've cleared your schedule, you've turned off your phone, you've alerted your loved ones that you need a special time to refresh your soul and listen to your inner self and listen to the Word of God and you have that stretching before you like a beautiful oasis in your busy life and for many people who come to a quiet day they find that they that is one of the few ways they can give themselves permission to take that kind of time so when you offer a quiet day to people you're always giving them a gift. So we're doing this in a slightly confusing way because our class meets at Wednesdays from 7 to 9, but we'll meet tonight for two hours and I will offer you what I call a Centering Prayer Refresher, which is a 40-45 minute slide presentation where I review the basics of Centering Prayer so if you're relatively new to Centering Prayer, it will help you to strengthen your practice and understand some of the basics. If you're an old timer who's done a lot of Centering Prayer, most people find that it's very refreshing to their practice to review over and over again, to go back to the basic guidelines and just uh, renew and inspire their practice. It's a kind of a lonely business sometimes doing centering prayer not only because we're we're going inside ourselves but also because it's hard to articulate what's happening within us so it's sometimes helpful just to hear it even though it's a wordless thing and there's something very beautiful and deep about going to a wordless place it can also be helpful just to hear it expressed in words to help you understand some of the dynamics of what's going on within you as you practice. Then we'll sit in Centering Prayer for about for 20 minutes. I'll lead you into it. And then we'll have a question and answer session, or you can make any comments on what the practice is like for you. Then I invite you, I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of our time together. I'll invite you to spend an hour sometime in between now and next Wednesday in a silent meal break, much as you would if you were actually at the quiet day. And I think that that's a very important part of it because many, many people have reflected back to me that that's their favorite part of the quiet day. When I just leave an hour for eating in silence in a mindful, reflective, you, well, I say mindful, reflective, mindful or reflective, there's, uh, you could eat in a very mindful, concentrated way, aware of every bite, or you could let yourself off, enter into a kind of a more dreamy state where your, your mind is just very receptive. Those two things aren't quite the same, so whichever you feel more drawn to is all right. But the important thing is to give yourself an hour where you are just eating and just listening, reflecting. You could do a little journaling, a little light spiritual reading, but just a, a time of a very unstructured time. Um, you could um, precede it with a period of centering prayer that might make it more rich for you. You could proceed it with a with a visit to the meditation chapel or um, watch a recording of one of our centering prayer sessions to kind of open yourself. 
and then just spend that hour time because that's people have told me over and over again that's m the most important part of the quiet day for them what it's it's humbling for me because it and but it also takes the pressure off me because in a way it almost doesn't matter what i offer what i say god is going to speak to you if you create those conditions you will hear things that you don't usually hear and and gain some insights that you wouldn't have gained if you hadn't just given yourself that time to be quiet and process and let the unexpected happen let the spirit move in some surprising way so please do take the time to do that hour of practice and maybe maybe make it an hour and a half or two hours if you if you do some centering prayer or some lexio before that to kind of prepare the way to till the soil the next wednesday we will meet for another two hour period and it will be a little bit more like what we usually do on Wednesday nights in that it will be a kind of a centering prayer service. I will give a little talk on creativity and centering prayer. And we will do a Visio Divina, but I've got something um, a little bit different planned than what I usually do in terms of our Visio Divina format. So hopefully that will be fun and interesting and inspiring. We have a lot of people in the class who are particularly interested in Visio Divina, so um, we've been giving that more attention than I was expecting to because it's it's exciting that people are are interested in that. And I, I noticed that there are a lot of people going to my website who are interested in Visio Divina. That's the third most visited page on my site, which kind of surprises me, and I don't know where this interest is coming from, but it's exciting because it's a new creative place where we can, there's not so much a set way of doing it as there is with Centering Prayer and Lexio Divina, so we can invent it together. And then we'll um, end next week's sessions with um, with comments and and reflections like you would at the at the end of a regular um, quiet day, but I might also invite my students to ask questions if there are things that you're curious about as students of the quiet day that you want to ask the participants about what their experience was like. That will be a time when you can enter into dialogue with each other, and you're welcome to stay a little late this evening too if you have questions for each other. So let's begin, and we'll have a little bathroom break about halfway through tonight. Are there any kind of logistical questions before I start with the refresher? It's wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful to see the people who come to the Tuesday and Wednesday night groups all mixed together with my students. It makes me feel happy. Okay, let's look at the slides and I will give you a little refresher. And one thing I wanted to mention, which Rose was particularly interested in, is some of you may have the ability to change the relationship of the, the size of the slide with the, with the pictures of the people, depending on what device you're on. Um, sometimes there's a little slider next to, kind of in between the slide and the pictures that enables you to, if you want to make my face bigger or my face smaller or the slide bigger, because sometimes it's kind of annoying to to not be able to see me talking and you're not you you, you don't need to see the text on the slide as much. So that maybe gives you some more control, although maybe not, depending on what device you have. Silence is God's first language. 
Everything else is a poor translation. In order to hear that language, we must learn to be still and to rest in God. And many of us are longing for silence in that way. Maybe even before we learned that there was a practice that could teach us to be in silence in a particular way. So we come to this practice with a hunger for silence and an intuitive sense that will, it will help us to be in relationship with God and to listen to God's voice. Centering Prayer was created by three Trappist monks who noticed in the 60s and 70s that there was an increasing interest in Eastern forms of meditation, especially amongst younger people. And these monks knew that there was a tradition of silent prayer within Christianity that was not so well known among Christians and even in monasteries, those practices were being lost. So they set out to go back to some classic Christian texts like The Cloud of Unknowing and Teresa of Avila. Thomas Merton had done a lot of work in terms of uncovering some of these texts and exploring contemplative prayer. And they set, set out to, to take the meditation practices that were described in these classic spiritual texts and make them very simple and accessible so that anybody would be able to practice them. And they also based the prayer on the wisdom saying of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, go to your inner room, close the door and pray to your father in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you, which is the instruction in prayer that Jesus gives his followers even before he gives them the Lord's Prayer. This is his, his preferred method of prayer. So who might be interested in practicing centering prayer? I've noticed a, a lot of different kinds of people who are drawn to it. There are Christians who are drawn to silence and often those those Christians don't know about centering prayer and they're very excited when they discover it or maybe even angry that it's been kept such a secret when they they needed it it's the kind of the missing link for them and now they finally have found this this useful tool that will help them deepen their relationship with God it's also very attractive to Christians who are uncomfortable with Christian dogma, who, are, who find it very healing to pray in a way beyond words that enables them to be with God in a Christian way, but without some of the aspects of Christianity that trouble them or confuse them. It's very attractive to meditators from other traditions some of whom may have fled Christianity because they had uncomfortable experiences, were uncomfortable in Christianity for various reasons. So they found it healing to meditate within the Buddhist or mindfulness traditions. But then eventually those people sometimes start to feel a sadness that God is not being mentioned. And they come to centering prayer looking for something that will unite the practices that they find very healing in other meditation traditions with their belief in God. Centering prayer can be appealing to people who are completely unsure what their faith affiliation is, but they know that they long for God and they need some way of being with God. And centering prayer is very helpful for those in 12-step spirituality who are looking for an 11-step practice that will help them develop deep in their relationship with God, even though they may not even be comfortable with the word God, but they need a practice in which they're surrendering 
to a higher power and Centering Prayer provides that. So whatever your orientation, you are very welcome in this practice, which is a very gentle, inclusive practice. This picture almost doesn't need a caption. Thomas Keating giving the Dalai Lama a little kiss. Thomas Keating was a real pioneer in interfaith dialogue. He was one of the three main founders of Centering Prayer. And Centering Prayer has its roots in Christian teachings, but its practice of silence takes us beyond words, beyond dogma, into a place where we can very naturally feel our connection with people of other faiths. We may have been brought up to think of prayer as thoughts and feelings expressed in words, but this is only one way to pray. When we say, let us pray, we're opening ourselves to relationship with God. And when we pray in the language of silence, we grow in intimacy with God in that silence. And we allow our whole being to enter into relationship with God, not just our minds. We're going to be talking a little bit when we turn to the guidelines about what we do with our thoughts in Centering Prayer, but thoughts really includes everything that comes up for us, physical, emotional, as well as mental. So it's a practice to which we can bring all of ourselves, not just our minds. So let's look at the four basic guidelines of Centering Prayer. I like to think of these guidelines as a little tiny suitcase that looks like it doesn't, it couldn't possibly have everything that you need for your trip, but you open it up and you discover there's a lot more in it than you were expecting. And whenever you feel confused about how to practice Centering Prayer, am I doing it right? Is there something I'm missing? Just go back to these guidelines and look at them because they really contain everything that you need to practice Centering Prayer. They're really packed with riches that, that may not be so apparent at first. So it's like peeling an onion. Every time we come back to them, we notice something new or something that we've forgotten. So I'll read them to you and then we will unpack each one of them individually. Choose a sacred word or a sacred breath as the symbol of your intention to consent to God's presence and action within. Sitting comfortably and with eyes closed, settle briefly and silently introduce the sacred word or the sacred breath as the symbol of your consent to God's presence and action within. When engaged with your thoughts, Return ever so gently to the sacred word or breath. At the end of the prayer period, remain in silence with your eyes closed for a couple of minutes. So the sacred word, centering prayer at the beginning level is usually taught with the sacred word. That's the most common way to teach centering prayer. Choose the sacred word as the symbol of your intention to consent to God's presence and action within. We're invited to choose a simple word of one or two syllables. That's what's recommended in the Christian classic, The Cloud of Unknowing. And some examples might be God, Jesus, Amen, Love, Peace, Trust, Yes. But you can choose any word, it doesn't need to be religious, it doesn't need to be the perfect word, it just needs to be a very simple word rather than a phrase, and a word that's neutral rather than charged with emotion, that doesn't cause you to think a lot of thoughts, that doesn't stimulate you, you, you don't 
need to be pondering the word or reflecting on it. You, you're just going to use it as a very simple tool. It's sacred in the way that we use it, not because of its meaning. We use it to gently redirect ourselves, point ourselves back towards God, and dis we silently say it whenever we notice we've become engaged with our thoughts. I'll talk a lot more about what that means in a minute when we're engaged with our thoughts. So it's a symbol of our intention, and it's our way of saying yes to God. So the word, if you, if you don't have a word, the word yes can be a perfect word to start with. And um, you're not supposed to change the word during the period of prayer because that would just be something to think about. You don't want to be thinking about, is this the right word? This word isn't working or something like that. You can, change, you can decide to change it, but don't change it in the middle of a practice session. Now, my teacher, David Fournette, who studied with Thomas Keating for 35 years and was one of the first students of Centering Prayer, and he wrote the book, The Path of Centering Prayer, he also teaches um, how to use the sacred breath in Centering Prayer. In Thomas Keating's classic book, Open Mind, Open Heart, he mentions the sacred breath, but he doesn't really describe how to use it, except for that he says that you don't use it, you don't concentrate on it like you would in an Eastern form of meditation. You just lightly touch it with your attention. So you're using it very much the way that you would use the sacred word. It's just a slightly more physical, embodied form of the sacred symbol. If you find the sacred word a little too intellectual or harsh, and you want a symbol that's more in your body, and it feels more gentle and natural to you to use the breath, it's a very simple, natural, embodied symbol of God's presence in us. Some people find it's appropriate at certain stages of their journey. One reason I like to teach about it is because I've found that a lot of people who've been practicing for a while have actually evolved into using the sacred breath without really naming it that way or knowing that that's what they're doing so it can actually be kind of affirming for people who have just evolved this particular way of practicing um, to be given permission to practice in this way. So just simply notice your breath when you're engaged with thoughts. Touch it very gently with your attention to use it to let go of the thoughts. The second guideline, the first is in two parts really, and the first part is about preparing your body. Sit comfortably, sitting comfortably and with eyes closed, settle briefly. And it's helpful to really spend a little time doing this. I tend to lead people into centering prayer. You know, some people just plop down on their cushion and they, um, set the timer and they head off and they and then they discover that their jaw is really tense and their shoulders are all hunched up and if they just taken a little time at the beginning to notice how they are in their bodies they could have avoided they could just start in a more balanced centered place or conversely if you're too slouchy and relaxed in your posture you can end up falling asleep you want to assume a posture that's alert and attentive, but not rigid. It's kind of like Goldilocks, not too this and not too that, not too stiff and not too loose. You just want to be comfortable. Notice if there's any tension that you should let go of. Just take the time to notice your body. Be kind to it and Allow yourself to be comfortable, but also kind of healthy and balanced in your posture before you start. Then the second part of this, the second guideline is 
silently introduce the sacred word or the sacred breath as the symbol of your consent to God's presence and action within. So that's the, the God part of the second guideline. Um, we introduce our sacred symbol as the symbol of our consent. We're reconnecting with what God means to us by using our symbol. So it can be very helpful at this moment in the practice when we're, we've just taken our posture to also just take a moment to check in with who is God for you right now? What is really alive for you in your connection with the divine? Teresa of Avila says, all difficulties in prayer can be traced to one cause, praying as if God were absent. We could transfer that saying to almost every, anything. All difficulties in living can be traced to one cause, living as if God were absent. So let's not pray as if God is absent, forgetting all about God and forgetting why we're there. We don't want to just sit ourselves down to do our century prayer just because that's what we do every day and it's, and it's our duty. Just take a moment to notice what is alive for you in your relationship with God and that noticing it doesn't need to take very long and you're not going to think about it in the middle of your centering prayer but that will enliven your prayer infuse your prayer and help to keep you motivated so that you don't so you don't forget why you're there and what you're doing because you could start to lose the desire to be in centering prayer if you lose that connection with God. But as long as you, you maintain the real aliveness of that connection, then you want to be sitting there in relationship with God, listening to God, consenting to God's presence and action within, allowing God to work within you. So just take a moment to notice who God is for you right now, whatever that means, in complete honesty and openness. Is it a sense of mystery or gratitude, community, justice, presence, or maybe something more difficult or dark that you're that makes you a little uncomfortable. Maybe you're angry with God or feeling very disappointed or feeling that God is, is absent. Whatever it is, just take a moment to touch that with your attention in all its aliveness and realness. And if you don't have a sense of what that might be, you could just ask yourself if you can remember a moment when you experienced the presence of the sacred in a surprising way, in a way that changed you as a child maybe, looking at a painting, dancing, swimming, just being in nature, whatever it is, an image, a feeling in your body. Just touch that with your attention, taste it, and just allow that to be a part of your prayer. And then you can let go of it. You're not gonna think about that during the centering prayer, you just it's like a spark that animates your prayer and also allows you to keep going deeper in your relationship with God. So the third basic guideline is when engaged with your thoughts, return ever so gently to the sacred word or breath. This is probably the most confusing guideline that people get kind of tangled up in. What does it mean to be engaged with your thoughts? Do you return to your sacred symbol every time you have a thought? No. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, thoughts is an umbrella term for pretty much everything. I've actually, when I did a presentation on um, centering prayer in the body, I took out the word thoughts and I just put a a line, and I said whatever's coming up, because if you if you focus too much on the thoughts. They had to come up with some word that would make it simpler to talk about, so they picked thoughts. But the problem with that word is that it, it encourages us to do that thing where we think of ourselves as a head on a stalk and our bodies as unimportant and everything important is going on in our head. But really, we're, we're in Centering Prayer, we're working with everything that's coming up, body sensations, pains, emotions that we might experience as body sensations, memories, whatever it is, it's part of your centering prayer. And it's just going to be there. That's part of being alive. Thoughts, you're going to keep having thoughts. You're going to keep having body sensations. The goal is not to stop having thoughts. They're inevitable integral and normal and they're part of the process some of the thoughts contain what need, need to be healed in your prayer the silence creates a space for that healing to take place so the thoughts and the silence and the prayer are all walking working together we're not trying to eliminate the thoughts we're just we're developing a different relationship with our thoughts by not becoming engaged with them. When you notice that you are very engaged by your thoughts, very distracted by them, that you're following a thought and getting all kind of engrossed in it, then you can use your sacred symbol to just gently come back. You're just kind of coming back for, to yourself and to God and just the thought may still be there, but you're not so focused on it and tangled up in it. And you don't need to worry if you, if you have to do that a thousand times. That's not a failure. It's just, it's just part of the process. It's like if you were training a little puppy to sit, you would tell it to sit, and then it would get up over and over and over again, and you would just tell it to sit. And you just do it very gently and non-judgmentally. -jud you don't need to get angry with yourself. You don't need to have a lot of emotion about what's happening. You just do this simple thing of coming back using your sacred symbol over and over again. And that's part of the prayer. It's not, it doesn't mean you did a bad job. That's just that's what you're doing and you're learning to do something very unfamiliar. It may be feel very difficult at first. You may have, be, have been doing it for many, many years and it may still feel difficult, especially at certain periods. Sometimes when it's most difficult, maybe that means that something particularly healing is happening. So you don't have to be concerned about it. You just keep doing it. Thoughts do not interrupt this prayer unless you deliberately allow yourself to remain engaged with them. We let the thoughts come and we let them go. Notice how you're using your sacred symbol. Are you using it like a hammer to pound the thought back in there? Or like a knife you're trying to cut off the thought? Just use it. Use the sacred symbol with great gentleness and tenderness and love towards yourself. And you don't need to get too emotional about it. That's just a waste of energy. You just do it in a very simple way. Now the fourth basic guideline is the one that is most likely to be ignored. At the end of the prayer period, remain in silence with your eyes closed for a couple of minutes. It's very tempting. Your timer goes off and the phone has been ringing and you've 
got a lot to do and it's very tempting to just jump up and run off but if you're if you don't if you're not experiencing the fruits of the prayer in your life then it's probably because you're not spending enough time on this important step it's a time of transitioning so that we bring the prayer with us we bring the energy of the prayer and um, David Furnett has a lot of suggestions about how you might do that. But the most important thing is to find your way to do it or to feel what is the way for me to do it right now in this session. You can just use your intuition to just, you know, what, what should I be doing with this time to bring this with me and to make a gentle transition so that my prayerfulness comes with me into the world. So some of David's suggestions are, you've been letting go of thoughts, you can just let go of everything and just be. And sometimes when you do that, you notice that there's some effort that you've been making during the centering prayer that you didn't really need to be making and you can suddenly feel like, oh, I'm letting go of that, that feels good. And that can teach you something because the prayer can be almost effortless where we're just making the gentlest, simplest movement of just returning to our breath or our word. It doesn't need to be a struggle. So you can use that resting as a way of just feeling your way into what the prayer could be if you could let go of the struggle. You can just sit there and gently come back into your sense perceptions, noticing the room and just enjoying the feeling of having been in silence and stillness for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You can dedicate the period of prayer to a particular person or concern. You could go through your prayer list if you have one or just allow things to spontaneously come up and pray for them. You could visualize bringing the prayer into your daily life, into a particular activity. If you've got something challenging that's about to happen, you can imagine the prayer energy coming and supporting you with that. You could say the Lord's Prayer or the Serenity Prayer or another prayer that's precious to you. I often just sit there and ask God, what, do, what would you like me to know? What, I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I'm in my most receptive mode. What, 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 what do you need me to know, God? What centering prayer is not? During this prayer, we avoid analyzing our experience, harboring expectations, or aiming at some specific goal, such as having no thoughts, that's a very common misconception, making the mind blank, feeling peaceful. You might feel peaceful when you do your centering prayer. You might feel the opposite of peaceful, and that can be sometimes very discouraging, but it doesn't mean you're doing the prayer wrong, not at all. That's just, you never know what's going to happen. It doesn't mean you're going to experience achieve a spiritual experience and in fact if you do have some kind of vision or something you're you're actually supposed to let go of that just like any other thought you're not supposed to repeat the sacred word continuously and you don't need to judge whether it was a good period or a bad period afterwards it's it's natural to try to do that especially when you're just starting out because that's that's how our minds work, but that's not really part of it because we're just, we're surrendering to God and we're inviting God to use that time in the way that God sees fit. And we don't really know what happened. So we just surrender to that. We just trust, which is the theme of this slide. I'm afraid I'm not doing it right. What is it supposed to feel like? It doesn't feel like I'm doing anything. I still feel that way sometimes, like 
this is so weird and it doesn't feel like anything and I'm in this kind of lost, swirly place that's not like any place I'm used to. David says this about that. Not realizing that you are praying means that God is praying, awakening in you. Not knowing that you are praying means that the workings of your intellectual mind are unknown or secret from your awareness and from the self who lives behind reflective thinking. So we're surrendering ourselves to a very mysterious, unfamiliar process where we're just trusting that what needs to happen is happening. We're trusting in the goodness of the prayer and in God's goodness. We're trusting that we're held in some particular way, even if we can't feel that. And that what's happening is not at all dependent on our doing. We don't have to do it right. We don't even need to, we don't need to do anything. We don't need to know what we're doing or what's happening. We can just rest almost effortlessly in God's presence. All we need to do is just trust the practice and keep returning to our symbol whenever we become overly engaged in our thought processes. And that's our way of saying yes to God. In many traditions, there's an idea of our basic goodness and we can experience that in Centering Prayer. Sometimes we have a kind of a taste of our basic goodness. It's something that Thomas Keating talks about. It's something that Chagyam Trungpa, who was the founder of the Shambhala School of Buddhist Meditation, talks about our basic nature of goodness. And Gerald May, the great writer of Addiction and Grace, talks about it within the recovery movement, that we can trust that there's a goodness in our nature. And when we spend time in centering prayer, we start to sense that basic goodness more and more strongly. We become, we trust that. God saw us. God created us and saw that we were good. That's part of the Christian tradition. It's something that we can feel. Now, sometimes we may not notice any fruits of centering prayer. We may not feel that there's very much happening. And it may be that other people notice before we do that something within us is changing. I think the serenity prayer gives a sense of some of the changes that can take place within us and how they how mysterious they are. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, I think all of us who have prayed that prayer know that it's very mysterious. Where does that wisdom come from that teaches us to know the difference? How do we, how do we tell that difference? How do we grow in acceptance, courage, and wisdom? We don't, it doesn't happen through our own efforts. It, and that's why it needs to be a prayer. It's something we we, we ask God for. And those are the kinds of fruits that we can see when we are faithful to our centering prayer, those mysterious ways of knowing. We, we, we start to experience ourselves as having a kind of a, an inner knowing that we are cultivating without quite knowing how it's happening. Richard Rohr puts it very well. Without inner transformation, there is no grounded or lasting reform or revolution. From a contemplative stance, 
you'll know what action is yours to do and what is not yours to do almost naturally. That's my experience with this prayer is that it teaches you to know and I can't even explain how or how that works or how you can be sure what is yours to do but but this prayer teaches you what do you need to focus your attention on and what do you let go of much as you do in the prayer where you you learn to let go of what you don't need to be thinking about it teaches you to do that in your life as well so some suggestions to practice two 20 to 30 minute periods of centering prayer two 20 minute periods is usually considered the minimum in the centering prayer tradition but I I encourage you to do whatever you can do you know don't be don't say oh I can't do two 20 minute periods and then don't do anything you know do do what you can do any amount will make a difference and you'll see fruits and if you find it very very challenging at first you can just do what is possible for you and grow in your trusting and comfort but but also challenge yourself to spend more and more time because you will you will find it fruitful it can be very helpful to to just imagine just maybe take a, a moment now to imagine if you're having trouble making the time to pray just imagine what the best way for you to do that would be. I personally do it first thing in the morning because that way it's less likely to get swept away in the events of the day. And then I do it right after lunch because I find that very refreshing, almost like taking a nap. It gives me a kind of renewed energy and clarity. And sometimes if I feel myself really fading and I think I'm tired, I might even lie down and realize, like, no, no, it's not that. It's that I really need my prayer. It's like it's part of my metabolism now that my prayer helps me to refresh and restore myself in a very particular way. It's very helpful to be part of a group, and it's so wonderful right now how easy it is to be part of a group with so many options available to us online and it's helpful to study um, to come back to the guidelines and come back to some suggestions about how to pray open mind open heart is the great classic of the field by Thomas Keating David's book the path of centering prayer goes more deeply into the sacred breath so if you're drawn to the practice of the sacred breath you might find that very helpful and my own book is written in very simple inclusive language we need to refresh ourselves at this deep level every day just as we need exercise food rest and sleep so also we need moments of interior silence because they bring the deepest kind of refreshment that's my experience with this beautiful prayer that it's deeply refreshing and we can trust that if we come back to us come back to it it will give us something that we need even if at the moment we're doing it it feels challenging so why don't we take about five minutes for a little break and come back and then I'll lead you into a 20 minute period of prayer and then we'll have plenty of time for for questions and reflections and anything that's coming up for you and also the student if the students have any um, questions just about the practical aspects of things you're welcome to ask about that as well okay so it's 801 so let's try to be back by 806 
Okay, so let's start to get settled in our chairs or on the floor, whatever, wherever you're comfortable. The only real guideline about how you need to sit is that you should have your spine as straight as you can have it. And you can sit cross-legged or you can sit on a chair. It's usually practiced with, Sundering Prayer is usually practiced with the eyes closed, but if you prefer, you can leave them open and just have them in an unfocused gaze a few feet in front of you, like in the Zen tradition. And place your hands in any place that's comfortable and stable where you won't have to wiggle around too much. Um, in the Centering Prayer tradition, we don't require that you you stay completely still like in the Zen tradition. So if you need to scratch your nose or shift your legs around, you're welcome to do that as you just try to avoid doing it unnecessarily because it can take you out of the silence and stillness and be a distraction. So you keep it to a minimum, but you don't force yourself to sit so still that you're in pain. And then it can be helpful to do a body scan and just notice what you're letting go, what you might need to let go of. If there are any particular places that you tense up, I know that I need to check in with my jaw and my neck and my shoulders and my hands and even my toes and just try to release them as best I can before we get started. And if it's helpful, you could take a few deep breaths and use that to notice what you might like to let go of in your body before we begin. You could give yourself a little wiggle or a shake if there's some part of your body that's tense. You can also do that occasionally during the period of pr prayer if you need to, to release a little tension. And if there's anything, if you have any particular physical issues that cause you, need you, that cause you to need to be in a particular posture, you should just do what you need to do to be comfortable. I sometimes need to sit on my hand to accommodate my tremor, so you may also need to do something particular. So just try to find a posture that's alert, yet comfortable, not so comfortable that you're going to fall fast asleep. If you do, that's all right. It can be a way of releasing, and it's not, it's not a crime to fall asleep, but it's not our goal either, so Try to be alert enough so that that's not going to happen and yet not so alert that you're, you're rigid and stiff. What does your body need to be happy and comfortable for the next 20 minutes? And you might just notice how you are emotionally, if there's anything that you like to just touch with your attention about your emotional state and let go of if you can. And then just take a moment to notice who God is for you right now, whatever that might mean. Whatever's alive for you in your relationship with God a sense of gratitude or presence, darkness, mystery, aliveness, mercy, community, justice, absence, whatever it might be. Just touch it with your attention 
and then let go of it. You don't need to think of that during the time of prayer, but it can infuse your practice with its energy. Then if you have a sacred word, you can allow it to rise up, silently sounding itself within you like a bell. If you don't have a sacred word and you need one, just allow a word to appear to use during this period. It doesn't need to be the perfect word, just a simple one or two syllable word to express your consent to God's presence and action within. Your way of saying yes to God's loving presence. Or if you're going to use your sacred breath, just touch your breath ever so gently with your attention. Whichever symbol you use, just know that when you find yourself tangled up with your thoughts, engaged with your thoughts so that you're following your thoughts more than you need to be, you can just use your symbol in a very, very simple way, just touching it ever so gently with your attention to disengage yourself, to bring yourself back to resting in God's presence, allowing your thoughts to be a little farther away from you. So I'm going to set the timer now. We're just going to rest in God's presence. Whenever you become engaged with your thoughts, just gently use your sacred symbol. Loving God, thank you for the gift of this time in your presence in this community of prayer.
You've been letting go of thoughts. Now just let go of everything and just be resting in God. And just notice what that's like. Are you letting go of something that you could be letting go of during the centering prayer time? Some effort, sense of struggle, a movement that's not really necessary? How does it feel to completely rest in God? And just trust that you were enough. That all you need to do is just keep turning towards God. When you get distracted, it's natural to be distracted. Just turn back again whenever you notice that you're distracted. This period after the timer goes off is a very important period of transition. So what is your way to use this transition to bring the prayer with you into your life? Do you want to just keep resting? Or do you want to just gently open your eyes and look around you and come back into this room where you are? Or you can silently say the Lord's Prayer or the Serenity Prayer or another prayer to yourself. You could dedicate the, prayer, the period of prayer you've just spent to a particular person or concern. Or you can visualize yourself bringing this prayer energy with you into some activity in your daily life. Or what is the right thing for you to do with this time to make a bridge between the prayer and your life? And whenever you're ready, let's start with any questions or comments you have about the practice itself. And then we can move into any questions about the, the logistics of the Zoom meeting in the quiet day or, any, or anything else that's coming up for you. Lindsay, I had a question. Um, it's kind of a specific question, but I've been taking a welcoming prayer course this month. So when I'm doing my centering prayer, I find my, my mind going to um, scanning, scanning different parts of my body to see if there's something there. And I, I wonder how to incorporate those or if that's natural. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Since I'm taking that course, I've been working with that a little bit myself. It's actually been reminding me of another practice, and this might be confusing to mention, but I'll just mention it anyway. Um, David Frenette teaches a practice he calls heartfulness practice, where you kind of move between resting in God-like and centering prayer and noticing your sense of God like we do at the very beginning of the centering prayer period, just touching that with your attention. And then um, 
just noticing whatever is coming up for you, just allowing all your sensations and experiences to be in the prayer and just allowing yourself to touch those with your attention. But then if you allow yourself to touch those with your attention and you're used to doing a lot of centering prayer, then it's kind of natural for them to just kind of recede again. So I guess, I guess what I'm saying is there's no need to resist the, the being aware of your body sensations, but, but you can be kind of transparent and open to them, but just don't let yourself become full, completely engaged by them. And if you notice yourself scanning in a very intentional way, um, just let go of that, just disengage from that is just another thought. But it's also might be natural if you are spending more time in the welcoming prayer or any other body practice that makes you more aware of your body, for that to just be a part of who you are, for your awareness of your body to just be more a part of you so that you're not in your mind as much. So. It's, um, it doesn't necessarily mean anything's wrong, that you're doing anything wrong. I mean, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's just a shift in your awareness. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you. It is tempting to do this welcoming prayer sometimes in the middle of the centering prayer, and I think we need to let go of that and let that be for another time. But you could also, you could start your centering prayer session by doing the welcoming prayer. And that might kind of get it out of your system a little bit and also help you to be more grounded in your body as you start. And then, and then let it go. And then let it go. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, my question was kind of along the same lines as Donna's, you know, uh, since I've been doing the welcoming prayer and taking the course, um, you know, I, I do practice it in my daily life. But what I have found, uh, I was through quite a bit of trauma over the last several years. And when I'm in centering prayer, uh, I find that some of my thoughts become so strong with the trauma involved that I was involved in, um, specifically last April where I was beat up very badly and almost died. Um, and I'll get thoughts of anger and all of a sudden my thoughts, I'm in the courtroom, you know, and I'm like on the, the edge, you know, and I've done trying to do to back off out of that, the welcoming prayer to allow those feelings to exist, but then to try to get me back to where I can quiet my mind and I don't want to confuse them. And I know there are two separate forms of um, encountering, um, you know, um, God, but um, when thoughts are so strong, when it is from some kind of a past event or something that has been really interrupted our lives, um, is it only just through the practice, and I have been doing it twice a day, that we finally will come with peace at that and be able just to quietly, quietlier, you know, in essence, centering prayer That's with our mind, question. quiet. First of all, I'm very sorry that happened to you, Maggie. That sounds like a lot no, to work no. with. Um, there yeah. is there is an instruction in centering prayer that's almost it's almost like a kind of a connection to the welcoming prayer in that there is an instruction in centering prayer that if some thought becomes so overwhelming that you can't let go of it that you can't disengage from it and go back to your sacred symbol then you allow that to become the word you allow uh the anger or the physical pain or whatever it is that's just totally gripping you to be the sacred symbol. And 
that can be more helpful than, than resisting. And then usually if you just touch that with your attention and let it be there, it will dissipate over time. And that might be more healing for you at this point to, to allow yourself to do as much of that as you need to. Thank you. Sung? Not, are you trying to ask a question, so? You're still on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. I think your internet is not very stable because you keep pressing. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I have no question. Do you have a question? Do you want to try and write it down? No, no, I, I have no question. No question, okay. Yeah. Cecilia. I have a question about what you said about dedicating the prayer period to someone or um, to an intention. So how does that work with the sort of trying to empty oneself of thoughts? Is it something that you bring into it in the beginning maybe, or what are your thoughts on that? Yes, you're, you're welcome to do it either at the beginning or the end, exactly. You don't do it in the middle, although you may find what I often find is that something keeps coming up during the prayer and then at the end I know it's time to pray for that person or that thing that they're very much in my attention or something has come up that I want to do that I realize I need to call somebody so I pray about that. But if you feel called to pray at the beginning as well, whatever feels right for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Lindsay, I have a question. Yes, Rose. Um, and, and I want to say I've been so moved by people's sharings, and this is not that same way. I I wonder, um, just in the way you run these these experiences, if sometimes people just share what came up for them, or if that's not what we do in 
in the group experience. No, I think that, yeah, yes, I think we do do that. Um, and that's sometimes more helpful to people. Sometimes people don't really have a question, but they want to, to share mm -hmm. what it was like for them, especially mm -hmm. if it's a very new experience or maybe sharing what came up for them helps them to articulate a question that they they aren't quite aware of because it's so it's so difficult to talk about i think that that's part of what's helpful about offering people refreshers over and over again because i know i come to to um talks like this not having any questions but then the the speaker can address something where i go like oh yes that's mm -hmm. that's what's happening for me but i couldn't necessarily have articulated it until they skillfully kind of helped lay it out so i think it's the same thing when you start talking about your experience there may be a question or an observation that is allowed to kind of rise up out of you when you allow yourself to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's something so mysterious and spirit filled about this and I think it helps us. We're blocked in different ways and, and this process of doing this prayer gets us flowing and needing to speak to each other afterwards can be part of that flowing. We may not even know what, what it is that we want to say, but we just want to connect and say something about what happened. Yes, and we're, we only have about 10 minutes left. So if any, if any of the other um, students from general want to ask questions about the logistics of this part of the um, of the quiet day or the next part of the quiet day or anything that's coming up for you or concerning you or if you want to ask about the silent meal or the instructions I sent out today or anything that's coming up for you at this point is welcome. I would like to do a silent meal at the same time as anyone else in this group. I would like a shared experience from a distance. And I wonder uh, if Friday at noon would be a possibility for anybody else. I see. Great, okay, Friday at noon. Where's that coming? Thank you, and Deronda, great. And I'll just mention, actually, that's a great question, Rose. When we first started, um, what what uh, Joe was asking, what time zone? That's Eastern time zone. Do you oh, want yeah. to talk about that too, Joe? Why don't I put you in touch? Anyone who wants to get, I'll, Rose, do you mind being the organizer of that? If I put Joe and others who want to be... I, I don't mind a bit, but I'm not quite sure what I would do, <laughs> except save the time. Yes, and, well, and also what I was going to say is um, when the pandemic first started um, and I was trying to figure out how, how, you, how do you have a quiet day on Zoom, this is all very new. I'd never done a quiet day on Zoom until six months ago when we all had to scramble around and figure out how do you do it. And one of my questions was, how do we do the silent meal? So the first thing I hit upon actually seemed to work pretty well, which is that I invited people to, um, I left the Zoom on during the silent meal on the Saturday, and in, I invited people to either leave their camera on if they felt moved or turn it off, or they, they could sit and eat in front of their Zoom, or they could leave the room and and allow other people to look into their space or if they felt more private they could have the camera off so there were a lot of different options but personally i found it very moving when people did leave their cameras on 
even if they weren't there in their space, even if they'd gone into their kitchen or dining room, there was something moving about. It, it gave us a way of being together, even if the person wasn't visually, even if the person wasn't visible. So you could consider doing something like that, getting together on Zoom, whether you you know, you might not want, want people to see you eating, depending on how you feel about eating. But you you could consider being t together on Zoom in some way like that. That's you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to ask people what they want. But I'll tell you, my my thought was from 12 to one, I share that time, but no visual. I would just like to know that we're all doing it at that time and we might want to touch base afterwards and you know but i don't particularly want a zoom experience myself i don't know if whatever else wants diana deronda i understand that's fine with me we'll be there eating together in, in spirit thank you okay and anyone else who would like to be part of that, I'll just yes, them and then we can, you right. and we can all be together in prayer and spirit. And we could have email contact afterwards. That'd be cool. So I could organize email contact. And you can share about what it was like next week too. And yeah, at the end of the session. Well, that, if that it's was, okay, can I just take notes, Deronda, Diana, and there was someone else. I didn't see in a different time zone. Joe. Joe. Joe one zero zero one. One zero zero one. Okay. Maybe we could just get emails. I'll ask you. There is a chat. Okay. I'll ask you. <laughs> anyway, I'll still ask you. Okay. Thank you. Rose, Cecilia. Yes. I'm at, at the mercy of work, but if I can do it, I'll try. Oh, lovely. Okie dokie. Thank you, Rose, for that inspiration. Um, I just was going to say I'm trying myself to uh, organize a Tuesday morning 30 minute centering prayer. And if people were interested in joining me, um, I'm going to be starting it next week for about probably uh, the six weeks up until Christmas. So I think maybe longer than that, it will be eight weeks from the start of November to uh, Christmas, Christmas Holy Week, I guess. Not Holy Week, but Christmas week. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just excited about that week. But Tuesday mornings at 8.30 to 9 o'clock, um, 30 minutes of centering prayer roll put my email out there so if people are interested they can just email me but it will be very similar to this just a 20 minute centering prayer I'll ask for prayer requests at the start between 8 30 and 8 35 20 minutes and then invite five minute reflections at the end uh closing at about 8 59 um so I'll just I'll put that in the chat and give you my email so um Tuesday mornings eastern time 8 30 um and if you're interested, just email me uh, on the email address, which I'm going to put in the chat at freeandfitnyc at gmail.com. So my name's Tim. That's there for you if you'd be interested. Tim, if you wanted to just send me a, a little blurb about it in an email, I can actually send it out. Um, there's a, I have an email um, chain of about 150 people who come to this group, and they might all be interested if, if you're willing to yeah i'd love to do that great just send me a little blurb so that it's all kind of ready to go out in our little newsletter which goes out tomorrow yeah i'll try and do sort of themed advent reflections for words oh. or uh, sacramental focus for the the month of december on those tuesdays and then in november just peace and serenity um for the season that we'll be in during that month which is forecast ahead of us <laughs> sounds great thank you okay so, jim is that eastern time on tuesday mornings 
Yes, Tuesday at eight thirty. Eight thirty Eastern time. Yes, I am. Is there anything else coming up before we break for for the evening? Well, feel free to email me any questions. And I'll look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, if not before. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. You're welcome, Modesta. That's wonderful. Good. Thank you, Lindsay. This was really wonderful. I got new things out of the slides. Oh, good. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Have a nice evening. How was your retreat day, Joe? Oh, he's gone. <laughs>